Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Victoria Herman. I am the principal investigator of the National Science Foundation Research Coordination Network on Arctic Migrations that is hosting this webinar. And I am so excited to welcome all of you from across the world to share in a discussion about Arctic security, borders, and immigration today. We have about an hour and a half of programming with two amazing scholars that will share their research on immigration and security aspects of the Finnish Arctic and Arctic borders and transnational actors. If you have to leave during this webinar, not to worry, we will be sharing a recording after we finish up today. If you have any questions throughout the presentations for either of our two speakers, please type those in the chat as they are presenting. We will be calling both of our speakers back onto our virtual stage at the end of their presentations to answer your questions, which I will moderate. If you have any technical issues, please also put those in the chat. I will be at the ready to help you out. And now for the show that you have all been waiting for, our two awe-inspiring speakers. First, we will hear from Dr. Heather Nickel, who will present on Arctic borders and transnational actors. She is currently the director of the School for the Study of Canada and a professor in the School of the Environment at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario in Canada. She received her BA from the University of Toronto um, and her MES from York University and her PhD from Queen's University. Now her research lies at the intersection of critical geopolitic issues in the circumpolar north and the relationship between the interest of nation states and peoples of the North. Today, she'll be diving into that geopolitical context of contemporary issues around Arctic borders and transnational actors. After Dr. Heather Nickel is presenting, I will then call up Dr. Nafisa Yesman, who will present on immigration and security aspects of the Finnish Arctic. Um, but before we get to Dr. Yasmin, I will call Heather up to our virtual stage. Um, again, if you have any questions during her presentation, please put those in the chat and I will make sure to register those for our question and answer session. Over to you, Heather. and you are still on mute. Okay, am I unmuted now? All right, wonderful. Still, okay, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Victoria. It's, it's just a pleasure to be here and talk uh, to you today. And I'm hoping that the screen, the screen share is, is effective. You can, wonderful. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk, uh, my talk today is about circumpolar borders, migration and non-state actors with a real focus on the intersection between these. And uh, I'm looking more uh, clearly at uh, indigenous transnational actors uh, than I am other kinds of actors, but that's just for this talk because I wanted to share some thinking I have and some broader, I would say broader conceptualizations um, that I've, uh, about, um, borders and and uh, arctic borders and uh, um uh, non-state actors and, and and trends uh that we're seeing um in the north particularly with respect to mobility and migration so let's start by thinking about the north itself i mean you know we have these many many uh um sort of uh, uh tropes of of the north as a frozen place the, the iconic scenes of uh, this golden sort of colonial era uh, age of exploration ships and frigates frozen in the ice and it suggests that there was a, a sort of a static arc um, and the moments of exceptionalism were when Europeans arrived uh, and, and, and or when mobility came in the form of explorers or mobility came in the form of fur trade or mobility came in the form of outsiders in the region. And then we contrast that, I think, with a, a sort of this, this trope today of a highly a mobile uh, contemporary north where ice is melting and, 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 you know, new shipping routes are coming through and it'll flows of traffic and, you know, uh, um, 
all kinds of, 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 of access to resources and geopolitical uh, conflicts. And I want us to think about that for a minute. Let's start by saying that, yes, of course, uh, today the North is a highly mobile place. And I, this is uh, um, you know, one of the Norwegian uh, diagrams um, that you've, you've seen before from the Arctic uh, portal. And, and, and this shows us that, yes, it's not just in terms of uh, you know, transits and uh, geopolitical scenarios, but actually, if you look at the North itself, there's a lot of population change. What does that population change mean? Well, sometimes in the case of Alaska, it means high population turnovers. Alaska is, you know, it's highly sort of mobile population in the U.S. and has been for 30 years. Its population doesn't necessarily growing, uh, but there's a lot of population turnover. And then, of course, with commercial fishing um, um, annually, you could, you can, you know, in Bristol Bay and places like that, the population will increase threefold. So it's it's not necessarily growing in number, but it's highly mobile. Then you can look at Yukon and the Canadian. Arctic or the Canadian subarctic and Arctic area. And Yukon is actually growing. Uh, a lot of it is by in migration that's staying. You have provincial nomination uh, uh, initiatives and uh, uh, a whole draw of both an international and the southern population. You move over to Nunavut, uh, and Nunavut is growing too, but it's not, it's growing by rates of natural increase. Uh, so it's not quite the same sort of uh, scenario. Uh, you can look at places in, in, in the Nordic area and, and, and really in sort of the, um, around the Murmansk uh, region, and you'll see that population is leaving. And I think that that's one thing that we have to understand. Mobility is also out, not just in. So while it looks like there's high population mobility in, in uh, Russia, for example, you've got particular areas that are really plagued by people leaving. Now, that's the scenario today, but I would like us to remember that the North has always been highly mobile. And I think that's the, what we can contrast in our frozen in time uh, sort of um, um, snapshot. There's nothing new about the buzz of ATVs and snowmobiles, um, the barking of sled dogs in previous times uh, before we had um, all uh, trained vehicles, um, and low, uh, lone hunters and conveys of families circulating the ice, the tundra, uh, the taiga forest, the reindeer herders, uh, following seasonal rhythms of life. The North has always been a highly mobile place. And in many senses and ways, uh, migration has been conditioned by the ecological, I'll call it the ecological integrity of the circumpolar region. I know that there's a, a variety in environments, but there is this, this sort of east-west circumpolarity, environmental circumpolarity, that has really conditioned mobility, and, and particularly in historical time periods. I'm not going to go back to you know, prehistory and, and migration of human hunters, but uh, or hunters and paleo, uh, um, you know, paleo hunters are crossing from uh, uh, Varengia and moving around. I don't know much about the, the, the Siberian North and I don't know much about the prehistory of the Nordic regions, but I do know there was the mobility there, often highly east-west oriented, and that continued historically right across the circumpolar region from large and sustained historic movements uh, uh, from the opening of the land bridge to the historic Greenland walrus hunt on Ellesmere Island. Whoops, typo there, I won't correct it. Uh, Ellesmere Island. Uh, that mobility and that east-west movement of folks uh, throughout the circumpolar region has continued. I had the good fortune of talking to uh, a former um, RCMP officer who was uh, up on Ellesmere Island in the late 1950s and 1960s, and he confirmed that the um, uh, the Inuit uh, hunt was, uh, the Greenlandic hunt was still going on in places like Alexandra Bay uh, as late as the 1960s. That mobility was still there. Now, I think we can contrast that with a slightly different kind of, of mobility. This is or more of the forced migrations, uh, but it does speak to the notion uh, uh, that the Canadian government had in the 1950s and, and, uh, and 60s, uh, certainly that there was a group of Inuit folks coming from northern Quebec that were at home in the uh, Canadian Arctic, and they were relocated into several areas of the high Arctic because at that particular point in time, there was not the same... Um, level of population of the Canadian Inuit, uh, Canadian Inuit peoples, uh, there was a greater presence, particularly in the Eastern Arctic of the uh, Greenlandic Inuit. But over on the, in the Western Arctic, 
again, speaking to the high mobility of the region, as, as, as Barry, my colleague Barry Zellin um, reminds us, um, uh, Inuvialuit is the home to a migratory Inupiat community. So even as late as 1930, uh, uh, Inupiat were crossing into and remaining in the Canadian Arctic and, and to many, uh, in many ways uh, uh, created the base population, which is now the Inuvialuit settlement region in the Canadian Arctic. So, so that, that uh, mobility has always been there. And, uh, oh, my, let, let me do this, hang on layout. Let me just do the slideshow because we're going to otherwise see too many. Yeah, there we go. Uh, that mobility has always been there. And, 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 and as you, as you, many of you know, um, you, you, today you have the situation of, of Inuit being spread across four international states, if you will, from uh, the edge of Russia, all the way through the United States, through Canada, and over to Greenland. And again, uh, prior to uh, the Cold War, that was a highly migratory population between uh, Eastern, uh, or excuse me, Western, uh, the Northwest of, of uh, North America and uh, uh, the Eastern um, edge of Russia. And we talked before about the, the, um, the connectivity between Greenland and the, uh, the Canadian Arctic and Arctic Asma Island. Then you have, of course, the Sami. You have the Sami spread in three, uh, over three international states, highly mobile uh, prior to the uh, establishment of colonial boundaries and, and, and located in the Sápmi area, the, the Sámi homeland, which is still evident today, although highly influenced by colonial, whoops, colonial borders. Uh, then you also have in uh, Northern North America, another example is of course the Alaskan, uh, the Northwest um, area of Northern North America, where the Alaskan border cuts across, as you can see, and you have all kinds of First Nations, apart from Inuit and Inuvik, but you have all kinds of First Nations divided on both sides of the line, particularly which in Hanan, Upper Tana, uh, Tlingit, and uh, um, a little bit of, uh, I think that the, the Tachoni uh, don't quite make quite cross the line. But so, so I mean, the minimum is for, for many groups that uh, you are a, a, a citizen of or your, your traditional territory and your family and your kinship ties cross at least one international border. So when I speak of mobility, that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the uh, historical uh, territory, territories of transnational uh, Indigenous peoples. Now, think about that, and then think about this, this mobility and this connectivity east-west, and then think about northern borders. There's eight states in the circumpolar region. Between them, they have many borders, um, but they're also crossed by many cultural and political entities, as we've just seen. And so I would argue that while historically the the impact of those borders, uh, even within the colonial era, wasn't uh, as onerous by the 19th and 20th century throughout the circumpolar North. And I'm going to focus more on, on the North American uh, example. Throughout the, the 19th and 20th century, those borders become increasingly onerous and disruptive. Now, if this is the, uh, uh, some of the borders along the Alaskan uh, Yukon um, borderline. And by the 1970s, they were weighing heavier on uh, local communities. And certainly post 9-11 into the 21st century, the problems that borders pose for cross-border communities of kin, of culture and language have become incredibly significant. And we're going to come back to that in a second, but I just want you to think about this while I'm talking, that, um, that one of the big issues with Northern borders is Northern border management models are based on post 9-11 management strategies. And a lot of us have studied those. Um, and, uh, but they're based on these strategies that really are initiated in the South because it's one border. And that's what people will tell you. You don't have one border for the North and one border for the South. So they rely on, a, they're, attuned to a different geography. They respond to commercial demand, economic efficiency, the USMCA, and prior to that, the NAFTA borders and corridors, high traffic corridors. Uh, they're um, uh, basically uh, efficient, they move people, but most of all, they move traffic. And every 
where you go along that southern border, say, particularly with Canada and the United States, you can find uh, a border crossing, you can find processing, you can, you can find programs and services that are really attuned to this commercial model. But uh, in the north, it's entirely different. You have the same sort of border model, but in the north, you have low density distributed population, informal border crossings, temporary migration, seasonal migration, um, uh, including uh, uh, you know, daily uh, cross-border activity in pursuit of subsistence and subsistence and food. You have indigenous communities intersected by international borders uh, in an evolving governance situation. Now you do have that on the southern border some ex to some extent too, but this is pretty well the entire situation in the circumpolar uh, north. And then you also have added to that the, the, the kinds of labor market demands, fly in, fly out industries and seasonal tourism, which is quite large uh, in the in, in circumpolar north, really in on both the uh, Nordic in the Nordic and North American side. So you have a totally different kind of a border. And um, I'm going to just give you an example of excuse me, not a totally different kind of a border, the same border, but very, very specific northern circumstances, I would say. And I'm going to give you an example along the Alaska-Yukon border um, and how this situation impacts and disrupts uh, indigenous communities. Now, this is Beaver Creek. This is in Yukon, uh, coming up to the Alaskan border. Um, this was, of course, a, a, a border that was surveyed in um, 1910, divided the upper town of Dene community, such as that at White River, uh, and uh, the community of modern day Beaver Creek from family and communities uh, on, in the Scotty Creek area of Alaska. So that border came right through. Now, what's interesting, there's a, we can talk more about this, there's a lot of detail, but um, it, what's interesting about this border, and, and those of you from Yukon on the, on the call will know that it's about 37 miles from the border post uh, at Beaver Creek to the border post on the American side. Captured in between that is 37 um, you know, kilometers, I think I said miles, 37 kilometers of what was hunting territory, fishing camps, historic um, um, uh, places where the, uh, the White River Band used to go to hunt. And could until the late, mm, after the 1970s, it became more difficult. Post 9-11, it became almost impossible. So you've got folks that are sitting in Canadian territory in their traditional hunting grounds, trying to get to their fishing camps that have to go through a border, pass border check to get to their fishing camps. Maybe not so bad going out, but imagine coming in. There's 250 regulations you have to, uh, that apply to any one, uh, you know, border crossing post. You're in an area where uh, you're hunting. You've got fish and you know there are fish and wild game uh, and, and, and firearms regulations. Not to say that it's impossible to do, but it's an onerous process when you've never left Canada. Uh, and you're visiting your, you know, your own uh, uh, family and communities hunting territories to consistently check back in. And there's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, issues of, of surrounding that. And then there's another issue. Uh, this isn't just the uh, the White River Band, but if you look at the Vuntut Gwich'in, not only, and we're more familiar with this, this the Arctic Wildlife Refuge piece, where um, it's uh, not just it's not people, but it's caribou. Uh, with, with cabin grounds on one side of the border, and in their seasonal migration range, they're impacting subsistence on the other side of the border. Um, and the problem is uh, that one the group that relies on the caribou on one side has no control over, over the conservation and protection of the caribou on the other side of the border. Plus, of course, it's a similar situation that we talked about with the Beaver Creek group that the Wintag which in particular in the Old Crow area, have been used to for centuries crossing that borderline uh, in pursuit of, of, of caribou and other game. And as we move to the late, uh, you know, uh, 1900, um, yeah, the late 1900s in the early 20th century, those kinds of uh, uh, mobility, that mobility is really a thing of the past. And it becomes increasingly onerous now for groups to cross over informally uh, in ways that they used to. 
So I guess the question is, uh, and, and we'll kind of slide out for a minute outside of, uh, uh, of North America, but you might wonder then, are we at the end of an era? And I just threw this picture in uh, the iconic picture of bicycles crossing the Russian, uh, Russian Norwegian border uh, in, in about 2015 the, uh, with Syrian refugees. Now they took, they took the bicycles across because you, Russians didn't allow you to ride across the border. And they left them on the other side of the border in Norway because Norwegians didn't recognize and, and, and wouldn't allow people, uh, safety reasons and, and other regulations wouldn't allow people to ride Russian bicycles. And so you, whoops, you get this iconic model of, a fence going up. Uh, also, in on the Nordic side, people first when this was built, in you know, sort of uh, against the uh, the uh, open migration, Syrian migration, people thought it was a rather dumb idea. And now, of course, with the situation in in, in Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, <laughs> it's the the idea of the Russian border fence uh, um, is has gained a little more saliency in Norway. But I mean, we could think of this and then think back to what I was saying about Beaver Creek and the increasingly onerous border uh, uh, and border imposition, the way states are imposing borders on transnational communities and ask, are we at the end of an era? Um, what I want to suggest in the last couple of minutes is that um, we've actually seen something else happening. Indigenous people's organizations, and here are, are the six that uh, are uh, with the, um, that we recognize with the uh, Arctic Council. Indigenous people's organization are bridging borders now in ways that they have not before. Um, and I want to just draw on two uh, examples uh, to show how that's happening. Because while we're having states uh, that are increasingly erecting firmer borders and surveilling them, we have the rise of, I would say, political clout and power of Indigenous people's organizations who are pushing pushing back on those borders. And, and, and a group who's been uh, particularly successful are the Inuit, of course, the Inuit Circumpolar Council and the various Inuit national organizations have pushed back and have in, in areas and have also worked with uh, state agencies to create new models. So remember the Greenlandic Inuit that uh, came to over to Ellesmere Island and were consistently uh, hunting up until uh, the 1960s. Well, they were hunting in particular around the area of the North Water uh, uh, Polenia or the Pixiela Sosorak. Um, um, and that is uh, open, you know, uh, incredibly diverse, um, open water, uh, you know, upwelling uh, uh, hunting reach. Well, it's open water and, and, and uh, the water stays open. And uh, Inuit have historically hunted in that area. It's a particularly rich hunting ground that comes over, extends over in, as you can see, on the bottom left into the Canadian Arctic. Now, instead of a firm border there, the Inuit have been negotiating and actually have been taking real leadership in creating a situation where a large, basically a large ocean management area is being established in, in this region. And now uh, there, are, there are increasingly uh, provisions for allowing that mobility that existed for centuries to continue, allowing Inuit from both uh, uh, Greenland and uh, the Can and Canadian uh, sides of the border to uh, traverse and, and hunt through the region and not to be subject to the same kinds of immigration um, um, and international immigration um, procedures that other groups might face crossing an international border. And then it's the same thing with overcoming the lines on, 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 on Tartupulak, which is the uh, Hans Island. And again, Inuit uh, in partnership uh, with uh, the Canadian and Greenlandic government have uh, uh, assisted in the creation of a provision for the right of uh, both, uh, for the right of Inuit of both Nunavut and Greenland to, for freedom of movement throughout the island for hunting, fishing, and other related cultural, uh, traditional and, and uh, activities. So, so we're beginning to see these models and I'd ask, and, and in a sense, I would ask what the future holds. And I'm just looking at the time. Um, it will be another minute or so, it won't be much longer. But what does the future hold? Uh, we have to manage uh, mobility in new ways that redefine southern border management models in the north. And I just put this plane in in this small northern airport to let you know that there's one uh, airport, one port of entry, POE 50, uh, in the Canadian Arctic could actually process a large international plane. 
you have to go to one place. There are pop-ups around and they, for smaller, you know, you can bring smaller planes in, you can POE 15s, they call them, or you can make special arrangements. But, you know, this idea of a, of a border that can function smoothly and, uh, and, and deal with the kind of mobility that we see in the North, um, it, it's few and far between. So we have to be thinking of new ways of managing these borders that redefine southern border models. Uh, the Assembly of First Nations uh, has done so. Remember Beaver Creek? Beaver Creek was visited by uh, Fred Karen, and the Karen report uh, dealt with the issue of not just cross-border mobility in the alaska yukon border, but in other areas. And the Assembly of First Nations um, uh, and the Karen Report, and I can just click on this, click on this link quickly to take you. I guess there's nothing such as there's nothing like quick. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, you can actually go to the you can actually go and understand that uh, the role of the Assembly of First Nations and how they've been working, not just on First River, but or, or Beaver Creek. But um, uh, with a host of other um, um, other groups. Okay, so uh, let me get back to what are some other issues? Uh, oh yeah, this this notion. Whoops, this notion of 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 area rather than line. Remember, we talked about the uh, north uh, the the the, the Polenia, right? And the or Pixia Sarf. I'm having trouble saying it. Pixia Sarfsola. Um, that is a model that is potentially usable in other areas. We don't have a border in the Beaufort Sea, but um, that and that border may or may not be defined in the future. But when it is defined, it's important to note that there's the Beaufort Sea Partnership, which is a co-management project uh, that integrates government agencies and uh, Indigenous people within the new settlement region and will in fact uh, have ways to understand and approach the transnational nature of that border. Um, so lessons for the future, I think in the Beaufort Sea area, I think we have lessons for the future in the Northwest Passage, which uh, I don't wanna get into too much today, but remember, bear in mind that the Inuit uh, ICC, Inuit Circle Polar Council, Inuit people in general, uh, uh, have a vested interest and have been participating in new ways of understanding borders within the Northwest Passage, new ways of understanding sovereignty. And I would suspect in the future, uh, new ways of managing uh, what we think might be intractable uh, uh, border uh, and boundary relationships by bringing to them this notion of uh, uh, the uh, supporting transnational populations and also you know international law which is now more and more looking to um, the rights of first peoples the UN declaration on um, the rights of indigenous peoples is more and more bringing uh, the view and perspective of, of first peoples into the understanding of defining borders so I think that's something for the future too the J treaty uh, the J treaty has been dismissed in Canada as something that doesn't apply. And it's very recently uh, coming to the forefront again, discussions about the inherent rights of Indigenous uh, folks to travel freely across borders. And there's been some important court cases that suggest that perhaps in the future, um, although Canadian uh, Indigenous people can travel to the US under the terms of the J Treaty, uh, American Indigenous people cannot travel to Canada and, this, and have the same rights in the same way. So there's discussion there that might have some implications for the border. I think, uh, however, I think what's big on everybody's mind and what may be one of the, uh, you know, uh, the most intractable mobility problems in the North isn't resolving uh, these these kinds of border issues I, and, and, and their relationship to transnational populations. But I think the real stress will come uh, when we, we look at climate change and migration. To date, climate change migration has not shaped uh, the kinds of movements and the scale of movements uh, that we've seen uh, in other, other areas of the North. Um, it's, it's not something that has happened yet, but there is, there is certainly a real concern, and, uh, and I think rightly so, that with, uh, the, um, with climate induced, there will be climate induced out migration because of 
conditions um, that are affected will be affecting uh, coastlines that will be affecting communities, permafrost, coastal slump, flooding, uh, storm surges, all these sorts of things that will be affecting in the future. So I think that that's another uh, perhaps uh, unseen impact uh, and that will affect us in the future. Finally, um, I think that another trend for the future is that we're going to be looking, remember the uh, ANWR and the uh, cross-border caribou migrations, we're also going to have to look at more closely at non-human borders, echo, you know, ecological continuity, uh, local scales. We're going to have to understand the relationship between circumpolar borders, uh, healthy migration, migration in harmony, which is the name of the, uh, the, the, um, this net, uh, network or this project. Healthy migration, human security, uh, has to, and, 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 uh, and transnational border management has to be understood also in context of non-human borders, uh, whether these be you know, uh, animal or whether these be uh, ecological or you know, um, uh, environmental. So, uh, I just would like to end, whoops, I'd like to end uh, just saying, well, I wrote a little bit about this in a, Andy Chater and I wrote a little bit about this in a book and you could follow up on some of the details because this is, I realize been a very, very general presentation, but, but thank you very much for your, for your consideration. Thank you so much, Heather. And if everyone could join me in giving Heather a huge round of applause, um, Thank you for really Oops. a wonderful presentation um, that took us, I think, geographically uh, and temporally all across the Circumpolar North. Uh, and I know I was uh, taking a lot of notes. Um, I'm sure everyone else was too. We have several questions for you, Heather. Um, and if you have any questions for our first speaker on um, transnational actors and Arctic borders, please put them in the chat. Um, we are going to uh, welcome our second speaker to the stage now. Um, and then we will be asking Heather to come back on after our second presentation to ask all of our questions to both speakers. So please get those questions ready and put them in the chat. Um, for now, I am going to ask our amazing second scholar to join us on our virtual stage. Dr. Nafisa Yasmin is going to present on immigration and security aspects of the Finnish Arctic. Um, she is currently from the University of Lapland, Finland, and is the lead of UArctic's thematic network on Arctic migration. And I should say that both Nafisa and Heather are steering committee members of the National Science Foundation Research Coordination Network that is funding this webinar. Um, Dr. Yasmin was the Academic of the Year in 2019 in Finland, which is pretty awe-inspiring, um, and her research focuses on Arctic migration with a specific focus on sustainable entrepreneurship development, regional development, migration management, community resilience, and social inclusion. All right, I am going to, again, um, hand over the virtual mic to um, Dr. Yasmin um, and uh, get those questions ready for both of our speakers in the chat. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria and Heather for nice presentation. And uh, I actually sent my presentation to you because uh, I tried here to share my screen, but I didn't. So is it possible? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So as uh, you have already uh, know about myself, so I would like to skip this slide. And I, I really would like to talk about sustainability and sustainable society and community first because uh, as you we know that we talk about we talk a lot about sustainability nowadays and what does the sustainability what is sustainability and what is sustainable society 
in practice, that is something that we sometimes overlook. And also sustainability as a concept, um, many of the researchers, many of the scientists say that it is a vague concept, but also on the other hand, some say that, yeah, it is, um, it, it, they are supposed to be um, some um, some long-term goal for every society uh, that uh, to actually achieve, um, achieve um, through different, but uh, what we see that, um, that a sustainable society or community is kind of a model society where a society uh, is um, able to uh, meet the need of multiple um, meet the need of um, multiple people and population and groups um, who are residing in that um, in that particular society. So if we are talking about society or community, we really, um, we really think that uh, it is a society or community where everyone in, a, in the society, every single group of people like, uh, um, like ethnic group of people or age group of people or any business group of people, whatever is a larger society has uh, the um, economic opportunities, and they can feel uh, a sense of security or sense of satisfaction and belonging. As, and uh, really, society can actually provide all those adequate access to public information, um, to their residents and also uh, sustainable society can uh, provide a safe environment of respect and tolerance for diverse perspectives and, and they are supposed to be in a sustainable society, political freedom and a sustainable society at the end of the day will maintain the well-being or psychosocial well-being of their inhabitants. So if it is the it is the concept of sustainable society and sustainable community. Then what is the next slide, if I can get, then I can tell you that um, sustainability is actually uh, linked, interlinked with sustainable development. Because when we talk about sustainability, then we also talk about sustainable development. Uh, so uh, if sustainable sustainability is the goal, uh, long-term goal of a society, and then sustainable development refers to the process and trajectories to achieve the goal. So if it is the sustainable society, then we have to also think that what would be the future sustainability of our North? And how could we actually maintain our future in the North? If I can get actually the next slide, I can also so show that why does sustainability matter in Arctic? And then I will come back to, because as um, we said, we know that North is a sparsely populated region. People are aging, birth rate uh, is also comparatively very low. And if we see in, in the cities um, up north, those are shrinking by population. And also we see that many of the cities um, in the north, uh, in Finland, and also in uh, the, uh, in the uh, European uh, north, that we can see that um, the people, uh, cities are actually competing each other to get more population, to attract more population um, in the region. Um, and uh, this is because of um, their unstable economic condition now, uh, where there is um, kind of uh, lack of ways of quality of lives, fewer opportunities for higher education. Those things are actually pushing people to move uh, from uh, North to Southern part. And then North is losing people. And then North North is trying to attract more people 
to make the uh, step, but in the north, as uh, we know that uh, Arctic nace and uh, geographical location, everything actually just discouraged people. People are actually coming here in this area region as a tourist, but it is very difficult uh, to mm -hmm. think uh, that how could we get them to stay in this region on to develop the uh, develop the uh, regional capacity. So if uh, it is the situation in the, in the north, then how could we maintain our sustainable uh, goal, a long-term goal for the future? Then who will be the polar people in the future? Then we actually now come in, uh, to immigration and uh, migration, because this is now the time for north to place immigration and gender at the core of sustainable development in the north and maintaining long-term economic and socio-cultural policies in the line with empowering immigrant women or immigrant men as well, because as we know that we are investing different kind of, um, you know, we are investing in different businesses. And also we are trying to attract people to come as work-based immigration. Then if we are trying to attract men, then there will be also those, those um, open positions uh, in the companies are mostly attracted men but also we have to think that we if we are just attracting now men then also there will be uh, their spouses and also their family at this at some point will come and then what will be uh, the integration policy uh, for those immigrant women who will come as their as the as um, or with uh, their spouse so achieving the goal of inclusion security and equality is the main priority at this moment in the north like uh, in the Finnish North, then uh, now I, if I get go, to, if I get to the next, uh, if I, yes, inclusion. So we are uh, when we are just attracting people from outside the uh, outside the region. Then also we have to think about integration policy. But how does this in integration policy? Weight on inclusion, existing policy feelings that uh, people are feeling that they are not somehow included properly, and the sense of belongingness that I have already told in my first slide that sustainable society, if we think that uh, we have a sustainable future. Uh, with immigrant and with a diverse uh, population in the north, then we have to also think about their integration and, and why what they are thinking. So, um, based on our uh, previous um, previous uh, research in Finland, we found that uh, people are feeling that uh, they are those uh, kind of uh, those points or issues that are that's supposed to be included in the policies are missing like for security people are uh, people feel that uh, they are their security is a matter of whether and how they are feeling uh, that they are secure or not this is also one of the main um, issues uh, that can also feel them or make them feel uh, secure in um, Finnish Arctic and also they believe that healthier social relation like friends, genuine friendship, social participation in sociocultural activities, those are also um, kind of the matters that can also make them feel that whether uh, they are involved with the uh, community where they belong or whether they are, uh, they, uh, they, do, they can have the sense of belongingness and also social well-being like i have said that sense of belongingness it is also a matter of fact uh, for uh, for make people think that they are included and also perceive equality whether uh, they feel that they are equally treated uh, or not the and diverse uh, diversity and risk like safe and where they can bring their diverse or where there are um, they are um, kind of um, uh, they, they are in uh, on the table so these kind of issues actually um, uh, 
uh, are um, discussed in our this, uh, previous um, research through, uh, I mean, in, in different um, uh, different focus group discussion. And then we found, uh, and from our statistics, then whether they are feeling and how they are feeling that their security uh, are protected or their equality has been treated um, properly or their well being is maintained, then we can feel, uh, we can see those, uh, yes, uh, we can see those. Um, statistics through the Finnish, um, in, uh, Finnish economic and uh, labor ministry. In my next slide, you can also see from that slide that this is 2018, and these statistics has been taken from the Ministry of um, uh, Economic Affairs and Employment. As you see that uh, no friends, and more than five friends, and uh, also here you can see that men and uh, women from different uh, different um, background like if if you can see that it is from russian 9.5% uh, of the russian male they say that they do not have any friends on the other hand 7.1% they feel that they have no friends and also you can see that uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, scores this percentage is uh, it is differ from one um, ethnic background to another ethnic background here you can also see uh, africa africa feel that with no friends and also uh 3.3 3 of them uh, three point is also uh, high in Middle East, from people from Middle East and North Africa. Uh, so 14.5% they said that they do not have any friend. Male and female, they said 16.2% of them said that no friends. But also you can see here that there, that there are also percentage of uh, friends, more than five friends. This, this is also something that many people um, actually answer that for, for example, Asian, India, Vietnam, Thailand, China, 38%, 38.8% um, of the male um, uh, counterparts say that they have more than five friends. And on the other hand, 35.2% uh, of the female, they say that uh, they, they have more than five friends. And then next slide, if we see, that participation rate in organized activities that we can also, it is also 2018 and we see also the difference between a uh, different group as well. Uh, so you can see that uh, part, uh, they, some people, they have participated in organized activities at least once in a month. And also some, they say that they have not uh, participated in any activities, any organized activities in last 12 months. So you can also see uh, that uh, the number or um, the percentage from Middle East and North Africa is higher here also, who has not, who have not participated in any or, um, organized activities. Uh, in last 12 months. See from the next slide that uh, Mm, yes, perceived insecurity in 2018, also uh, males respondent, they said, for, for example, Estonian men respondent, they said that 35.4% uh, of them said that, that uh, um, uh, they experienced insecurity. And also on the other hand, 49% of Estonian females uh, feel the same. And also uh, Asian, the, the Asian men, 33.5%, 33 they feel that they experienced insecurity or they perceived insecurity and also 25% percent of Asian female slide 
unemployment rate also we can see here that uh, unemployment rate in different um, years like 2015 to 2020 and um, this is for whole country but it also uh, uh, depends uh, from region to region like in the north uh, um, unemployment rate is higher than the whole country it is uh, 20 uh, 28 percent in, in in the north among uh, immigrant um, population so next one also if we can see perceived discrimination. So uh, in the labor market, uh, also you can see here, it is also to, from 2018 that uh, the um, different, um, different uh, ethnic groups feel in different uh, way and they but anyway they uh, they all feel that they perceive discrimination in the labor market but some um group they feel that it is a higher in and they are uh, they they actually perceived uh, more than other group but other also feel well that uh, yeah and they are they are is uh, they feel they perceived less discussion in the labor market so here also we can see that uh, Asian male, 44.4% uh, of Asian male, they perceive discrimination in the labor market. This is the highest score here, uh, highest number, and also uh, in, um, in the female group of uh, America, women from EU and North America, 35 percent, 5.6% of them uh, perceive discrimination in the labor market. So if you can go to the next slide then. And physical activities also, uh, it is somehow um, also one uh, issue that uh, immigrant women uh, they also feel that they do not have, uh, they don't, uh, they do not have, uh, they do not participate in any physical activities. Um, uh, if you, you see that uh, Middle East, uh, women from Middle East and North Africa, uh, they 53.2 percent of them, they have not participated or involved in any physical activities uh, in um, uh, 2018. And also, um, but uh, this is the this is the high this is the vulnerable group actually they do not do, um, participate or involved in any physical activities, which has also a relationship with well being. So if we go to the next slide, then we can find that uh, this is actually challenges. Like um, in many uh, cases, they feel that uh, they are excluded and also they feel that the, um, the whole integration policy in the host country like Finland, it is a really lengthy proce procedure because uh, they don't know even that how long it takes to be integrated properly into the society and also underemployment, uncertainty uh, in the labor market also make them feel that they are vulnerable and they are not secure um, because um, because um, basically uh, people who are working at this moment are also are not satisfied in the labor market as they are underemployed and also uncertainty like um, there is no permanent job basically seasonal jobs they are who are doing is uh, kind of five or six five to seven months job and then uh, it is also uncertain that whether they will get the job in next season and also education for some reason they have to also who are uh, from outside eu uh, they have to also discontinue their education because uh, their um, a credential or uh, their diplomas are not um, recognized, which need also more uh, time or it is a lengthy process uh, to continue. And also uh, language is one of the barrier. They have to first um, start language and then they have to start their education. And also some of the um, convention like um, this uh, Bologna Declaration and the Lisbon uh, Convention, uh, Recognition Convention, though Finnish, uh, Finland is a ratified uh, party of this, uh, this, uh, uh, this um, 
um, uh, directives, but still uh, it is, uh, and according to those, um, those, uh, those directives, any uh, university in Finland or in the ratified countries has uh, the autonomy to recognize the um, diplomas from um, the, their country of origin, but it is not yet happened as it has been recognized by the uh, national um, board or advisory board or um, or the ministry so it uh, always take also time uh, and then also um, misconception and miscommunication and low interaction also one of the issues that also uh, make them uh, feel vulnerable because uh, language issues is a, a most um, uh, is the most um, barrier uh, for um, with uh, other people and all uh, um, this is the barrier also has an impact uh, on uh, in integration and it has uh, an adverse as they say that it has an I mean that my respondents say that it has an um, uh, adverse impact on uh, integration, um, overall integration, and also a lack of long-term policies or policies uh, for different group of people. As it is um, also, um, it is also discussed that uh, the needs of the people are different based on their um, educational background, cultural background, or ethnic background. But uh, they feel that uh, that uh, only one policy uh, to uh, for for all group of people is not enough, and it is uh, needed to have some um, women specific policies or men specific or based on some um, uh, some kind of uh, depend uh, depend uh, dependentness like uh, interdependent uh, dependent or. Uh, independent if uh, they just make the categories and then make the policies or, or particular policies for particular group of people would be more um, if effective and then and then they say that this is also uh, they feel that there is a lack of long-term policies um, overall and um, and also support from co-ethnic group because when they don't feel uh, they don't uh, communicate with local people uh, in um, many other different, they also feel that they need support from their co-ethnic group, which is also a uh, uh, also very small number in the northern part, and that's the reason also they would like to move from northern part to other part in the uh, in the uh, to the southern part, or maybe to other country to get uh, um, or to involve with their co-ethnic group. And also sometimes they feel that it is also a challenge for them that uh, whether uh, because there is no um, job and other um, job facilities or alternative options in the labor market rather than entrepreneurship. And sometimes uh, they are pushed to being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur and which has uh, also ended up with um, closing their business in many cases and which is not also sustainable because the market is small and uh, many other barriers like uh, legal barriers because uh, the uh, they do not have information um, enough about the business system and business law has an also adverse impact um, uh, for um, for the sustainability of their entrepreneurship and then next slide uh, we can also see that security and human rights aspects are also one of the issues, um, uh, one of the issues that uh, also um, uh, hinder their integration, like the practice of uh, practice of one's own culture. Uh, though uh, Finnish, uh, of, though they do have uh, the rights to practice their own culture, but in many respects, they cannot actually practice their own culture. As uh, according, uh, for example, this um, kind of um, uh, their cultural practice of halal slaughtering, some of the Muslim group of people they feel that uh, this is uh, something that has been banned in Finland, and it is, this is also contradictory uh, with their um, their um, 
fundamental rights to practice their own culture and rights to access of uh, access of information as i say that uh, most of the um, informations are, are available in uh, finnish languages so um, it is also difficult for them uh, to get uh, uh, accurate uh, information from different sources. Like uh, also it has uh, come up that uh, um, according, uh, during a COVID uh, time, also all these um, uh, regulations regarding COVID uh, are also uh, not available in different languages at the, at the beginning. But of course, afterwards, they found in different other languages. And hierarchies between linguistic minorities uh, also uh, one aspect that's supposed uh, to be um, that barely protected and handled. And then I, I already said about discrimination and uh, societal exclusion. Uh, so uh, those are already um, I have shown through this uh, statistics. And then political freedom of speech uh, is also one thing that they feel that if they don't speak language, then also it is very difficult uh, to know about uh, about those uh, issues that can uh, that that can help them to practice their um, their freedom, political freedom. So as the end of the day, what we see that uh, that sustainability approach that I have actually discussed uh, earlier, that a model society that we are talking about or a sustainable future that we are talking about in the North is uh, basically based on um, based on part, um, partly uh, immigration issues. So, we need to have people in future, but try to shape our integration policy to attract them into this region. So our next slide is some um, some findings uh, for sustainable approach. Like moral values sometimes need to be identified and revealing factors uh, shaping acts of agency, aspirations for achieving well-being is also uh, need to be um, need to be handled and also understanding experiences. They feel uh, that uh, experiences supposed to um, uh, all policies uh, that uh, are uh, um, and that. Uh, uh, we need to do or uh, is uh, supposed to be based on under um, based on experiences and also intercultural learning that has also one um, uh, one aspect uh, one aspect uh, has uh, come up um, through this uh, um, discussion that uh, we need to know uh, we need to um, we need to share our knowledge about intercultural issues and um, about diversity and then reciprocally agreed and use tools of communication is sometimes also um, better to think for sustainable approach uh, to communicate with other people and piloting and sharing the best pieces of evidence from different part of the country or different part of the Arctic is also uh, needed. So this was basically uh, my presentation to this presentation and thank you for your attention, uh, but I will um, answer questions and we'll uh, take comments. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. If everyone could join me in giving a huge round of applause for a really comprehensive uh, presentation. I know that I learned a ton um, and made me think a little differently about inclusion um, and sustainable development in terms of migration and immigration uh, to communities in the North. Um, I am going to invite both of our speakers back onto the virtual stage uh, for some question and answers. If you have any questions for either of our speakers, please either type those in the chat or go ahead and go down to reactions to raise your hand so I can call you on. Uh, I am first going to ask Christopher to come on and ask your question. Hello, everybody. 
Um, thank you very much for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I learned so much and it was a great wealth of information. So thank you for that. Uh, and thank you to the organizers and the moderator. Um, my name is Christopher Kiase. I am a graduate student at American University in Washington, DC, focusing on Arctic uh, security and defense uh, in relation to climate change. And my question is for Dr. Nickel. Uh, specifically, how does climate change impact the mobility uh, and migration uh, to move across borders for coastal communities within the Arctic? Uh, particularly, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but the European Space Agency uh, had stated a figure that 55% of the infrastructure currently located uh, is currently located on permafrost uh, and within 100 kilometers of the Arctic coastline. And so, as we all know, the permafrost is melting rapidly. So how is climate change impacting that? And what are your experiences? Thank you. Great, thank you. That's a wonderful question. And I, I'm going to break it down to two things. First of all, if we're just talking about mobility, mobility is different from migration. Mobility is profoundly impacted already. Uh, it, whether or not a community has moved or is in the process of migration, the uh, uh, mobility patterns have changed because of the unpredictability, uh, certainly in terms of, of um, environmental knowledge of, of following traditional patterns of, of uh, you know, hunting. And, and listen, in the North, everybody isn't a hunter. I mean, there's stores, but, uh, you know, there is there is a pattern of country food and living off the land where possible. It's 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 partly a strategy. It's, it's, it's partly uh, for, you know, a strategy, cultural strategy. It's partly a, a, a subsistence strategy. So there is a lot of um, hunting going on in traditional territories, and those territories are are changing and and you know the stories of people going through the ice and and all kinds of environments changing and 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 and, and animal migration patterns and availability changing that kind of mobility is is uh, changes to mobility uh and the way people use the environment is, is ongoing um at, at, i was interested and i've been sort of following keeping one ear to the climate change uh, mobility um uh, literature which i really don't know very well but i do know that the big the big mo movements haven't happened, but they're there. I, uh, they're they're there, and I wonder. Um, in thinking about that, uh, Christopher, I think that we have some. We do have some precedent in understanding how people move and migrate. And while we think of a rapid, you know, clear out of the region, don't you know? If it depends who you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, with kin, with you know family and kin and community, I would suspect that you'll begin to see greater and greater consolidations of communities as people move, you know, move together and shift and and change uh, to adapt because that's that climate change and adaptation has been the story of you know of, of of the circumpolar region and all the great migrations and movements have been in response to 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 climate but uh an environmental change but now of course you have more permanent settlements so i think the first strategy will be small scale movement uh and i think the next you know the other strategies will then you know, open up to, you know, to broader movements of people perhaps out of the region. And I know in Canada, um, and not necessarily as a result of climate change, result of climate change, but just in general, a result of, of cultural change and globalization adaptation, you've got huge, say, Inuit populations in Ottawa uh, that you never had before. But I don't know that we're, you're not going to see abandonment of the region. I think you're going to be, see strategic, strategic change. What was, that? was there? That was the question, right? Did I answer it all? Yeah, you did. Thank you so much, uh, Heather. And I will say on the uh, permafrost degradation and mobility, we will have a webinar in two months or so with two other scholars that focus on permafrost um, from a architect landscape and from um, an urban studies scholar. So that might be of interest to keep an eye out because they'll be talking about mobility from the permafrost perspective. Um, this question is uh, for both of our speakers. And 
It is focused on mobility borders and immigration from the war, the Russian war on Ukraine. So there, um, there's a question about if there is an increase in migration from Russia into other parts of the European Arctic. Uh, a broader question on what the Arctic Russian borders look like. Um, and is there uh, any comment on kind of security and cooperation among Arctic states um, that may no longer be in use because of the, uh, um, the war on Ukraine? So Heather, um, I'm not sure if you want to, to go first and then um, Nafisa, if you want to come in second, but I'll, I'll bring you both back onto the virtual stage. Okay, well, I'll, I'll say that I'm not entirely sure. The first question was about the impact on, I, I, I think our second speaker is much probably more qualified to speak on the impact of Russian migration. Um, I mean, I know it's it has been affected. I, I, I know that um, there are changes. I can talk a little bit about the Norwegian border where I understand um, that there, well, part of the problem, part of the problem is that, that say the Russian Norwegian border, and I and, and I'm not again an expert at all on the Finnish border, but uh, you know there was there was sort of shared extractive uh, extractive in, labor forces for extractive industries and in parts of Norway in the northern area. You had a port, and that was now now no longer functioning the same way. But but so uh, that border is now effectively closed and it's really torn apart in a sense not an indigenous population the same extent but a, a, a extractive industry population that did move back and forth uh, and that migration has pretty well stopped from what I understand and then now Norway has to look to other ways of of redeveloping you know kickstarting economic um, and other kinds of social infrastructures to replace that um, there was another question. It was Russian migration. What was the? Oh, I'll I'll, I'll tackle the uh, um, the Russian border uh, issue. I'm um I'm sort of agnostic. I'm 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 a wait and see sort of person uh, about how uh, security borders in the circumpolar region will change. So I think that's a second level. Uh, piece. I know people have been arguing that the North will change drastically, you know, and they have been for the last year that the security in the North is, you know, on the front line of, of uh, uh, security issues because of the invasion of Ukraine. I, I, I don't think the two are as intimately tied as, as people might suggest, but I obviously could be totally wrong. I think that the Russian Northern strategy um, is still operating on a slightly different rationale and that you certainly we see uh i think that the, the trick is um um you know not necessarily having trigger fingers with regard to the north because we've always worked on a, well for the last 20 25 years worked on a cooperative uh um so, yeah, this cooperative uh, sort of model. And there are many, 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 many ways still to cooperate uh, that uh, the Arctic Council countries can use. And we'll see what happens in, in when the uh, uh, Russian chair is, is finished and whether you know the Arctic Council starts up again effectively or not. Yes, I also agree with Heather because uh, I um, don't know that much about Finnish border and uh, I mean uh, cooperation with Finnish and uh, Russian um, partners because uh, I I've been in a um, in a symposium um, last year December in Belgium uh, November it is about the future um, the future of the future symposium future arctic symposium and also we have discussed there that uh, it is uh, uncertain very uncertain that when next time we are going to start cooperation with russia and other partners who are involved
and uh, that you are the team also when we are going to start this um, you know, mobility again. So I think that, um, and also about um, immigration, if we are thinking of um, uh, we in Finland, uh, because we are in Lapland, we, I'm from Lapland University in the north, and we have not received yet any refugees or any um, any asylum seekers to uh, out this way, but we are getting uh, more Ukrainian refugees and um, and also we are estimated 42,000 Ukrainian refugees this year um, to be uh, welcome to here. And we are almost ready to welcome them here and to give them a secure place and uh, accommodation. Uh, but we don't, we don't know yet, but it is estim estimated number. So yeah, it is very difficult to say at this point that uh, what kind of uh, mobility and migration um, and what kind of cooperation is uh, um, uh, going to um, be um, to be permitted or how could I say uh, we can go into develop with uh, Russia and when it is impossible to say at this moment. Thank you both. Uh, yeah, still developing. And uh, as Heather noted, I think a uh, robust conversation will be had as we approach May and the transition from Russia to Norway in the Arctic Council chairmanship uh, and what might come from specifically the Arctic perspective. Um, so we have time for just one final question, um, and it is to both of you and has to do with tourism. Um, so for you, Heather, um, how does increased Arctic tourism impact indigenous mobility? Um, and for you, Nafisa, how does increased Arctic tourism impact sustainable development for immigrant communities uh, in Finland, but you know, maybe also in a wider European Arctic context? Great, great. Well, you know, as uh, everybody learned, um, perhaps Franklin didn't learn it so much, but uh, as many of the great Arctic <laughs> explorers learned, you know, you can't do tourism without uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, peoples. You, you know, the uh, they are the tour guides of the uh, the original tourists, so to speak. I think it's a it's a really interesting question, and it's a really interesting thing to think about because on the one hand, you have um, you have two ways of looking at it you have certainly and i think my colleague will speak to this that it's you know the the sustainable development piece and the erosion of environment and the and the erosion of quality of life that um uh, one often associates with large influx of tourism and the kinds of infrastructures and 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 and, and you know and sort of disnifying culture if you will uh and uh that's one piece. But if you think about it from a mobility point perspective, you're certainly not going to have um, uh, tourists going to places without Ouch. Indigenous folks or without Indigenous settlement. I mean, this is where they go. Uh, and when the great tour ships go through the, you know, what was the Crystal Serenity was that huge one that that went through for a couple of years, where do they go? They go to villages. When there's a whole other group of Venture Canada, and I, I, again, there'll be Alaskan tour ships and, 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 uh, and Nordic tour ships that go through. Uh, but where do they go? They go to, uh, they always offload it, you know, sightsee and then offload at villages. And I think that the impact for mobility uh, quite frankly, uh, all things considered in the balance of, well, if you don't fall, your community doesn't fall into the sea, uh, but stays there, then is the uh, ability for communities to re you know, remain sedentary uh, because of the influx uh, of tourist funding because um that is a, you know that is a way of, of getting cash, right? So I think it could uh, in some ways uh, contribute to, more fixed mobilities. I I don't see tourism driving out uh, uh, or or driving you know out migration by any means. I think it it could um, uh, you know offer some kind of al 
alternative that allows a lot sustains larger numbers and communities and to make them a little more sedentary not to say that you know not to enter in the whole debate about is that sustainable is that good is that bad you know do uh, indigenous do indigenous peoples want this yes do indigenous peoples not want this yes i mean it really depends what community you're in and so i don't want to generalize and speak for indigenous peoples but i think that could be that could be one impact Oh, oh, I forgot. And there's another. Sorry, I just will say it really quickly that with large scale tourism, of course, comes large scale, the, the large scale need for uh, things like <laughs> search and rescue and other kinds of infrastructures. And so I think, again, that could also contribute. It's not just the money coming in or the, uh, the ability to make a living in place. It's the uh, all sorts of other infrastructures and services that will come in as well. Yeah, tourism has a uh, um, big impact on, on the labor market, lapis labor market. And uh, as what we have uh, uh, noticed here that uh, many of the people who are uh, who, were, who have been unemployed for long, like immigrant, they are getting, um, getting access to the labor market through tourism sector. And uh, nowadays, uh, all the time, tourism is getting uh more and more uh, popular in uh, finland uh, and then uh, we are also having many tourists every year has uh, uh, creating um creating also opportunities uh, opportunities for immigrant group of people and through tourists also or we are also um uh, spreading uh, spreading uh, the worse uh, from tourists uh, to their uh, pe uh, people and in their country and also we are getting through this way we are getting also more uh, students in the university so i think that uh, i think it has an uh, it has a uh, impact on um, immigration of course and because uh, as we know that uh, in our university um, and the number of uh, applicants this time international applicants is more and higher than uh, any other years uh, or past years so and uh, I, I, I think that it is also actually um, increasing possibility for migration and attracting uh, migration. And also it is one of the way to retain, um, uh, retain immigrant uh, in the region as well. Because uh, also we are seeing the job as well and also when we are trying to attract also tourists uh, for summer tourism as well um uh, besides winter tourism so uh it is uh, it might be uh, it might create an opportunity for whole year job um because it is now more uh, seasonal based but if it is um if it is um, whole year then also it attracts more immigration Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, and thank you to everyone uh, who has joined us today for this webinar. If everyone could finish up by giving a huge round of applause again to our two speakers. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your experiences with us, um, and to sharing the past hour and a half with this amazing group. Um, once again, uh, this is part of a wider research coordination network where we host monthly webinars. If you are interested in hearing about our future events, please make sure to sign up for our monthly newsletter in the uh, link that I shared in the chat. And we hope to see you at our future webinars on permafrost degradation on the Arctic Council transition um, and on ocean pollution and marine mobility. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope you have an amazing rest of your Tuesday wherever you are in the world. Thank you, everyone.